Matthew a few weeks ago, and, and so this morning is our third message in this series, and it's titled Emmanuel, God with us. Uh, so let's pray, and then we'll get into our sermon this morning. Lord, we just thank you so much for all that you've done for us. Your faithfulness is great, and Lord, whenever we're worried uh, about uh, what is happening in our lives, we can just remember all the good things you've done for us, and all the good things you will do for us. And Lord, one of the greatest things you've done for us is given us your word and your Holy Spirit so we can apply it to our lives. And so Lord, as we get into your word this morning, we pray you'd open up our hearts and minds to hear from you. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week, we looked at the importance of family from Matthew chapter 1, and we saw how God decided to use a good man and a good woman, uh, a good husband and a good wife at the center of his redemption plan to save humanity, to, to raise Jesus in this world. And we saw that... Joseph really was a just man. And he shows this by his desire to maintain personal righteousness, but also in his extension of mercy to Mary when he thinks that she's guilty. She's not, of course. We know she's not. But he shows both, uh, he wants to uphold the law, but also be merciful. And we saw that Mary is the greatest woman who ever lived because she got the great blessing of being able to be the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is an incredible blessing. She got to carry the Lord in her womb. And we noted throughout most of Christian history that most European women would have seen, been able to see everywhere Mary as the example of what a woman should be, what a mother should be. And this would have had an incredible effect on the society of Europe throughout history. And we saw also that Catholics can take this too far, <laughs> and we shouldn't go as far as them. But we should still not forget her powerful standout example. And today we're actually going to look at the same passage again. We're going to look back at Matthew 1, verses 18 to 23. But I want to focus on something a little bit different this morning. See, talking about family is really important. Talking about family is really important. We live in a day, an age, where there are so many pressures and attacks on the family that it isn't funny. There are external pressures. There are all kinds of external pressures which are placing pressures on, on the family so that both the, the husband and the wife need to work just to, just to pay the bills. There are in, also internal pressures, the expectations that we put on ourselves that we might have wrong ideas from the inside about what family is. And then there's a whole bunch of stuff in between. And the, but the predominant way we all live is in families. That's God's intention for us, and it's a good thing. Psalm 68, verse 5 to 6, this is what David tells us. A father of fathers, this is what he's telling about God. He's a father of the fatherless, and a judge of the widows is God in his holy habitation. God setteth the solitary in families. He bringeth out those which are bound with chains, but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. See, God wants us to be surrounded by people who love us and cherish us. And he wants what is best for us. That's what God wants for us. So advocating for the Christian version of family is important. And the more our culture rejects that, the more we should double down on it and continue to proclaim it. But as true as that may be and as important as family is, there's something even more important in this passage this morning that we're going to look at. There is a much more profound truth that I want to focus on today, and that is the idea of the imminence of God, the fact that God is with us. See, the coming of Jesus Christ, the incarnation, as the theologians call it, which literally just means to be in the flesh, is the most important event that ever happened in the history of the world, aside from creation itself. It is the cornerstone of everything before and after that, and it is the most important thing that anyone will ever hear about. And if it is not the anchor of your life, and if it is not the center of your life, no matter how well put together you seem on the outside, your life will be shipwrecked if, you, if this is not the center of your life. And see, how your eternal destiny goes depends on how you respond to this truth and how you apply it to how you live. So what I want us to do this morning is consider what Matthew wants us to take in, from this passage on the idea of Emmanuel, God with us. So if you have your Bibles with you, open up to Matthew chapter 1. We're just going to be looking at verses 18 to 23. So we looked at these verses last week, and we noted a few things. As I said, we noted how good Joseph was. We, noticed how, we noted how they vindicate Mary and show that she was truly innocent. But they show us something even more important. But let's read them again, what the angel says to Joseph. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. 
And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, divorced, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, within these few verses that we see here, we actually see the fulfillment of many of the promises and blessings that the Lord had given himself. So what I want us to do this morning is examine what this passage is fulfilling so that we can have a fuller understanding of what the angel is actually saying to Joseph. Now, I noted a few weeks ago that Matthew puts a lot of emphasis in his gospel on the idea of fulfillment. Now, all of the gospels do this to some degree, but none more than Matthew. If you read through the Gospel of Matthew, you'll see again and again how he notes fulfill or fulfilled again and again. He places a big emphasis on this. And this is very important to establish. And the reason it's so important to establish is because there are some Christians who do not understand the proper connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And they don't understand how thoroughly interconnected these two Testaments are. And there are even some who think that the church is secondary in importance to Israel. And some even go so far as to say that the church is the backup plan and that God has two different peoples, Israel and the church. The argument, and this is a simplified version, goes a little bit like this. That Israel are the people of God and God came to his people and they rejected him. So God went to plan B, which was to establish the church, And then one day, he will go back to plan A and save all of Israel. Now, this position hits on some important truths, but it actually, they're incomplete truths. It's it's a misunderstanding. See, the truth is, many Jews did reject Jesus. If you read the Gospels, you will see that. But not all of them did. Remember, the entire early church was made up of who? Samaritans? No. Babylonians? No. The entire early church was made up of who? Jews. It was entirely Jewish. So how can the church replace Israel if the entire early church is made up of faithful Israel? Or put it another way, how can the church be different to Israel if the entire early church was made up of faithful Israel? Also, Israel is God's people, but he did not reject his people. Paul makes this very clear in the book of Romans. He did not reject his people. Because if he had have rejected his people, then the promises would have failed. He didn't reject his people. All he did was cut out dead branches. Israel and the church are different names for God's people. Remember, what does the word church mean? What does the word ecclesia, church, mean? Do you guys know what it means? What does it actually mean? Gathering or assembly. Now, these just happen to be two of the main names for the people of God throughout the whole Old Testament. Also, it is true that one day a large percentage of Jews will be saved. Paul prophesies this in Romans 11. That is, all Israel will be saved, as he says. But they will do so by trusting in Jesus, because there is only one way to be saved. And when you trust in Jesus and you get saved, what do you become a part of? The church. You become a part of the church. Because all who believe in Jesus, whether Jew or Gentile, are, what did Paul say, are One in Christ Jesus. There is only one message, both for Jew and Gentile. So Matthew's focus on fulfillment, which we're going to see as we go through this gospel, highlights something incredible. Just how Israelite and Christian the gospel message is. The gospel message fulfills the hopes of Israel. The hopes that were made to Abraham, to David, to Moses. And our hope is in that fulfillment. Our hope is in that same fulfillment. See, all who believe are children of many sons, his father. I am one of them. So, (laughs) let's just put, you know the song I'm talking about? All who believe are children of Abraham, in other words. I didn't actually have that song in there, but I thought everyone knows that song, or most people. There is only one message for Jew and Gentiles, only one hope 
only one way to be saved, and that is through Jesus. And the apostle begins by showing how the coming of Jesus fulfills one of the most important promises that was ever given to the people of God, and that is that God would dwell with us. So what I want us to do this morning is we're going to explore this concept of God dwelling with us, and we're going to go right back to the beginning of the Bible by discussing what our original purpose is. So I want to ask a very simple question. What is our purpose? See, many people wonder what is their purpose in life. What is your purpose? People try to figure out what is their purpose. And there is an entire snake oil industry out there which is designed to get your money to give you human answers to this question. And so many people will be told to seek inside of themselves to seek inside of themselves, to seek the wisdom of ancient spirits, to read the Bhagavad Gita or the Kabbalah or the Gnostic Gospels or some modern spiritualist rewriting of these same things. They may be told to seek their purpose through education or career or social engagement or some other way. Gordon Gekko once told people the way to find your purpose was through greed. Remember that movie, Greed is Good? Obviously, it's not good, and he ended up in jail. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so don't listen to Gordon Gecko. <laughs> Others will promise you that you will find your purpose when you find the one that you're meant to be with. But that's a pagan idea, but yet still many Christians believe it. But there is no promise in the Bible or anything in the Bible which says you're meant to be with just, there is the one that you have to find that completes you. The Bible shows us something very different about our purpose. What the Bible shows us is that we are created to reflect God and to enjoy him. Genesis 1, 26 to 28, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over the earth, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. See, out of all the creatures that walk on this planet, there is only one that's given the image of God, and that is humanity, mankind. And to be made in the image of God means to have his stamp, to have value, to be able to participate in the divine nature and have the privilege of choosing between what is right and what is wrong. In other words, free will. And it is clear that God gave us this gift so that he could have fellowship with us and walk with us. Genesis 2, 8 to 9, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden, But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? See, Adam Adam and Eve were created in the likeness of God in lesser measure so that he could walk with them, talk with them, fellowship with them, and so that we could choose to do this, so that we had the choice. And God did not have to do this for himself. You know, the scriptures never indicate that God is lonely or alone or needs us to be happy it, or, or that God's in need of human fellowship. The Bible never indicates that. Jesus actually shows us how God the Father and God the Son had perfect fellowship before the foundation of the world. John 17, 4 to 5, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me. Now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Now, God exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and he existed in eternal fellowship, eternal relationship. He doesn't need us. He does not need humans for companionship, and we're not his puppies either. We're not pets, (laughs) like some people think. We are not amusements. See, creation does not exist for any need that God has, because he has no need. He's he's self-sustaining. But it exists for the benefit of the creation itself. It exists so we get the privilege and the joy of getting to experience his goodness and glory. Psalm 1611, you would make known, you want to know what the purpose of life is? Well, here it is. Psalm 1611, you have made known to me the path of life or the purpose of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. That is the purpose of life, to enjoy him. What is the chief end of man? (laughs) According to the Westminster Catechism, do you guys remember? 
Yes, to love God. And John Piper changed it to to love God by enjoying him forever, which is emphasizing the fact that he created us to enjoy him, to experience his glory and his greatness. In other words, creation is a gift for our benefit. We benefit. See, Adam and Eve got to experience this in its fullness and in its greatness and in its perfection. And how long they were alive before the fall, we will, we'll never find out unless we ask Adam and Eve or God himself one day in heaven. But we see God's intention for mankind in the fact that what were Adam and Eve given access to? The garden of God. And what does it mean to have access to the king's garden? It means to have access to the king. I mean, this is, uh, this is the garden of uh, the kings of France at the Palace of Versailles. I've seen it in real life. It's epic. Go to that palace, right? And you, you, you've heard of gilding. You know what gilding is, like gold gilding, you know, fine gilding. Well, it's, it's so ornate, this palace. The gilding has gilding. <laughs> like, it's ridiculous. You can kind of understand <laughs> why the French rebelled, because <laughs> the amount of wealth in that building is just phenomenal. But still, to this day, it's a beautiful place. But to have access to the king's garden. If you had access to King Louis's garden, who did you have access to? The king. And so God created Adam and Eve to have access to him. And this shows how God desired to share himself with humanity. And not just to share himself, but everything that is good that comes with that. Everything that is good comes with that presence. And he wanted to share it with the man and the woman. And what did they do? They rejected it. They said no. It wasn't enough for them. You know, some atheists and skeptics will try to, you know, try to prove Christianity is true and say, well, if God's such a good God, why didn't he make the world perfect? Well, the answer is simple. He did. We said, we don't want it. <laughs> we rejected it. We allowed sin into the world by rebelling against him. Because to make it perfect, he also had to give us a choice. And humanity chose to reject him. See, we ruined it by allowing sin to destroy it. God gave the man and woman everything they could need or want, including each other. And they chose to follow the deceiver instead. And this caused a cataclysm, a sundering, which still has dramatic effects in humanity to, to this day. Do you guys, have you ever heard of a, a thing called PTSD? You've heard of PTSD? Yeah, Post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, PTSD was originally uh, called shell shock, and it was applied to soldiers who had gone through intense trauma uh, in the midst of battles. And particularly guys from World War I and who sat under those artillery barges. Could you imagine being on the brunt of those artillery barges? Just terrible. And it has developed into a commonly referenced psychological disorder, generally witnessed in people who have gone through some kind of extreme trauma, which was too much for them to handle. And it's intense. And it's accompanied, it's accompanied by things like nightmares, uh, night sweats, tension and stress, and all kinds of other health issues, anxiety, the inability to really face this life. And when some people experience intense shock like this, this leaves a psychological mark on them for the rest of their lives. It breaks them. It breaks them. It breaks what they're intended to be. And all of humanity in some way is experiencing PTSD because we've been ripped from the presence of the garden of God that we're supposed to be a part of. We're still living in the shock of having been sundered from the presence of God in the garden of God. We have spiritual PTSD, you could call it. See, we were supposed to live in a perfect garden. We were supposed to live in the perfect presence of God with all the goodness that came for that, which had perfect peace, perfect joy, perfect pleasure. None of the stresses that you can think of in life. That's what we were actually created for. That is how we were supposed to live. We were supposed to live in the shelter of God for eternity. That's what we were created for. We were not created for this sinful world. We were not made for that. And it feels wrong because it is wrong. It's not what we're meant for. It's not what we're meant for. This is why even when you've achieved everything that you can think of achieving in life, 
it doesn't bring full satisfaction. You still have a longing for more. Why? Well, as Jim Carrey said, I think everyone, everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see that it's not the answer. How many celebrities do you know who are depressed, you know, who commit suicide or get addicted to drugs or destroy their lives in some other way because they get to the very pinnacle of the experience of life you can live in this life and it's not enough. It doesn't satisfy. See, we feel this longing, this sense that something is not quite right with this world because we have been exiled from our true and proper home, the place where we're supposed to be living. And Genesis 3 tells us this very clearly. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the garden of God, garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the gate of the garden of Eden he placed a cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. He drove out the man, kicked him out of the garden of God. We no longer had the direct access to God that we were created for, that we need. God cast us, for, cast us from his presence because of our sin. And what do we know about sin? Sin cannot be accepted in the presence of God, which is why when Adam and Eve sinned, they needed to be kicked out of the garden. He is a consuming fire, a terror to evil. And what does being fallen mean? It means that we became evil. As Jesus said, remember he said it a couple of times, you, though you are evil, give good gifts. In other words, what's, he, what's he's pointing out? We are not what we're supposed to be. We are fallenness in our wickedness. We have fallen in our wickedness. And the reality is still true, and it's still a sensitive spot for human beings today. Many people get angry or offended or annoyed at hearing the truth of their spiritual standing before God and the truth about their reality in this world. I mean, they will just get furious if you mention that some things offend God. One thing that the person who has been traumatized fears the most is the truth of what happened to them and what has been done to them. They want to forget it. They want to suppress it. They want to shut it out, hide from it, pretend it never happened. That's why so many men who went through the wars World War II didn't want to talk about the war. So they wanted to forget it. That's why so many people today find it hard to even talk about what happened during the COVID years. Because it was so traumatic for them. They want to just forget it. They want to pretend like nothing ever happened. But God's intention, this is what humanity is like in reference to our sin and the fall. But God's intention was to never leave us in that situation of being exiles. Because we saw last week from the very beginning of the Bible, God's intention was to fix everything, to solve the problem of evil. Genesis 3, verse 15, I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And so what we read through the rest of the Bible is the story of how God is making a way so he can walk with you and I again because that's what he wants to do. Even though we've been given over to evil because of our sin, he wants to make a way to live with you, to live with us, to walk with us. See, God has promised to be with us, to be our God. And he starts this promise by creating a great people. See, if God first begins by promising the childless man, Abram, you know, Abram means father of none. <laughs> That's what it means. Abram, he promises the childless man Abram that he would not only have great descendants, he would have great descendants and be given a great land and become a great people. Genesis 15. And so he brought him outside and said, look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Have you ever tried to number the stars? You'll be there all night. <laughs> and then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadamanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, and the Girgashites. It's kind of annoying how one of those doesn't say ites at the end, but that's just my OCD. Anyway, 
and the Jebusites. <laughs> God promised them to be a great people with a great land. And God promised them this land so that he could be their God in their midst. Be God in their midst. Genesis 17, 6 to 7, I'll make you exceedingly fruitful and I'll make you into nations and kings shall come from you and I'll establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. This is why during Jacob's lifetime, God comes to him and tells him he will bless him at a place that Jacob names Bethel, which means what? What does Bethel mean? The house of God. God is revealing to his people that he is going to make them a people and he's going to give them a place and he's going to live in that place with them as their God. See, God's intention is to live amongst us again, to live amongst his people. He will not abandon us, even though that's what we actually deserve. But he will not abandon us. And this is why when God brings his people out of the wilderness, sorry, out of Egypt into the wilderness, in the cloud, you know, in the mighty cloud, he doesn't stay in the cloud. He asks them to take their best craftsmen and their best builders and their best tradesmen and go to their best materials and build him a place to dwell, the tabernacle, and to place in it an ark. Exodus 25, verse 8 to 9 and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst, exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and all of its furniture. So shall you make it. And then he places his presence with them. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, they did not set out till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and fire was in it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. You know, what made the ark and the tabernacle, also called the tent of meeting, or well, tabernacle just means tent, God like camping. <laughs> what made the tent of meeting and the ark holy was not the gold and the materials it was made of. It wasn't the hands of those who made it. What made it holy, what made it special, what made it a place of holiness was the presence of God in its midst. God's presence sanctified it, made it holy and sacred and a place of wonder. And wherever the ark went, wherever the ark went, there was holy ground. Wherever the ark went, there was holy ground because there was the Lord. That's where the Lord was. Do you remember what happened when the ark is captured by the Philistines in the days just before Samuel? Uh, do you remember what happened? They put it in their temple, and then their god, their false god, Dagon, falls down before it and then breaks itself, and then the people start getting sick. Why? Because it wasn't a special object. No, it was special because it had the presence of God in it, and he was there. And that's why the false god was forced to bow before him. See, God's presence, the ark was both a promise and a warning. The ark is both a presence and a warning. It's a, pro a promise and a warning. It's a promise that God would dwell with his people and be with them. But it was also a warning that he was over them, watching them and watching their sin. And as we noted before, God's presence cannot tolerate sin. Have you seen Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark? It's one of the greatest movies of all time. <laughs> I may be biased because I love Indiana Jones but do you remember what happens when the Nazis try to open the ark at the end but yeah they all die <laughs> why because they cannot be in the presence the movie got it right <laughs> they couldn't be in the presence of the ark uh, and, and it destroys them God's presence cannot tolerate sin if the people do not deal with their sin if they allow their sin to grow if they do not follow the uh, if they do not follow the, the sacrifices and the the commands of God, then he will withdraw his presence from them. So it was a promise, but it was also a warning. And the tabernacle was part of God's plan to bring his presence back to humanity, to bring us back to our original purpose. See, God's intention was always to, deal, to dwell amongst his people, but sin, our sin, makes this a real problem. So God produced a plan to solve this. 
And to some degree, God's presence in the tabernacle, in the ark, actually made the land of Israel holy. It sanctified the land of Canaan and made it holy. It was made the holy land. Why? Because it was a special place? No. It's no, no more special than anywhere else. What made the holy land the holy land? The presence of God in their midst. But this was only one stage of the plan. There was more that God was going to do. The next stage is the temple. See, the temple solidifies the presence of God amongst God's people. But notice that in the scriptures, God was pretty happy to dwell in a tent that could move from place to place in the midst of Israel from the time of Moses all the way through up until the time of David. And, and really, at the end of the day, what's the difference for God between a tent and a stone building? It, from his perspective, there's not really much difference, is there? Because they're both temporary things. I mean, obviously, a stone building is more permanent than a tent. But where's the stone building today? It's just as thoroughly gone. So David decides he wants to build a house for the Lord because he's got a nice house. He wants to build the Lord a nice house. And this is what God tells him. When your days are fulfilled, 2 Samuel 12, 12 to 17, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you and who shall come from your body and I'll establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I'll establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words and in accordance with all this vision, Nathan spoke to David. You know how the Israelites would have seen the presence of God in a permanent building, a, a stone building in their midst? They would have thought that this made them invincible. That's how they would have seen it. They would have thought this made them invincible because they had seen what the ark of the Lord had done to the enemies of God. I mean, look at the way it terrified the Philistines. They had seen how God had defeated so many of the enemies of Israel, especially with Joshua when he was carrying the ark through Jordan and through uh, the land of Canaan and conquest. And they knew that God was all-powerful, and so they would have seen the presence of God in their midst in this beautiful building as making them invincible. And this went to their heads. Because that's what, go, that's what happens when people think they're invincible. There's a great scene in a James Bond movie where this guy shouts out, I'm invincible, and then dies. It's hilarious. <laughs> that's great. Uh, <laughs> so God had actually told them that he would dwell in their midst if they did what he said. They would be blessed to have his presence if they lived as he said. He didn't tell them they were invincible. He told them they were invincible as long as they were faithful. Deuteronomy 30, verse 15 to 20. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today by loving the Lord your God, by walking in His... Notice how it starts, if, if. I was taught at Bible college to always notice an if means a conditional clause. That's a technical term for it. It just means there's conditions. By loving the Lord your God, by walking in his ways, and by keeping his commandments and statutes and his rules, then you shall live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. But if your hearts turn away, and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are going over the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curse. That's how covenants were structured. They had blessings for obedience and curses for punishment. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice and holding fast him. For he is your life and length of days that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob to give them. See, God's presence in their midst was always conditional. It was always conditional. God cannot abide sin. 
Do you see this theme? We're we'll going all the way back to Genesis. It's the same theme. He made a way for their sin to be dealt with, but if they ignored his laws and his sacrifices, they would become too wicked for him to dwell amongst them and he would leave. See, Jeremiah tried to tell the Jewish leaders that God was going to destroy the temple if they did not repent. And you know how they treated him? Like a heretic. They basically, they say, you, this, this can't happen. It's invincible, Jeremiah. What are you talking about? It's invincible. And, and because of this, they wouldn't listen. Once built, always built, was the Old Testament version of once saved, always saved. They fell into pride because they thought they were invincible. And as sure as the night is darker than the day, they rejected God again. And just as, just as Adam and Eve had... And God eventually tired of their rebellion, and so he departed from Israel. We read this in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 10, verse 18 to 19. Then the glory of the Lord went out from the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubim. And the cherubim lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth before my eyes as they went, and the wheels beside them. And they stood at the entrance of the east gate of the house of the Lord, and the glory of the God of Israel was over them. This was a monumental event for the people of Israel. This is in the time of the Babylonian exile. That's when Ezekiel lived. And it was a few years into the exile where the temple was finally destroyed. But before it was destroyed, God took his presence from the temple. And what made Israel great was not that they were the best of nations. What made them great is not that they were the smartest of nations. What made them great is not that they were the most holy of nations, because they were none of those things. What made them great was one thing and one thing only, and it was the presence of God in their midst. That and that alone is what made them great. This was God's greatest blessing to them. This is what sanctified them, and the loss of God's presence from the temple was just as devastating to Israel as Adam and Eve being kicked out of the garden was to them. Because not long after God withdrew his presence, then Israel was defeated. I mean, the Israelites were half right. (laughs) They were invincible as long as God was on their side. And God was on their side if they followed him. But when they stopped following him, he was no longer on their side. See, all of their hopes were based around this promise. That God would dwell with them and walk among them. All of their hopes. And all of our hopes are based on the same thing. Every good gift comes from where? Every good gift comes from God above. To dwell in the presence of God is to dwell in blessing and all the good things that come from God. To be cast from his presence is the definition of hell. In fact, hell is defined as cast from the presence of God in in 2 Thessalonians. So after the Jews were punished in exile and brought back home, They rebuilt the temple, they reinstituted the sacrifices, but it was never the same again. It wasn't quite the same. God told them that one day he would fill the temple again with glory, but they knew that things were not right. Israel never became powerful again, they became slaves of other nations, and there was something that wasn't quite right. And so all of the Israelites were longing for the day that they would be saved that their redemption would come. And this is what Jesus is. This is what Jesus is. He is the power of God amongst his people. So we saw this passage last week. We're going to look at it again. We saw this passage last week. When Jesus was born, this is from Luke, uh, his parents take him to the temple, and we see this wonderful woman called Anna, the prophetess. And it says this, Luke Two verse 36 to 38. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin. And then, as a widow until she was 84, she did not depart from the temple, worshipping and praying, uh, fast, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at the very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him, speak of who? Jesus, to all who are waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Anna knew that Jesus was the redemption that the Jews had always been waiting for. There was all the hopes of Israel wrapped in that one little boy who was God and man in the flesh. God 
with them, God amongst them. See, when the angel says this to Joseph, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. This is not just the fulfillment of a promise in Isaiah, a prophecy in Isaiah, although it is that. It is fulfilling that prophecy in Isaiah, but it is much more than that. It is also the fulfillment of God's intention for Israel, for his people, for humanity, that he would dwell amongst us and make a home with us. See, the apostle was showing that although we human beings have become lost, God was not going to leave us this way. Although we were cut from his presence, he was not going to leave us as exiles. Although we stood condemned, he was going to find a way to make a way for us to be saved. God would not abandon his people. Anna knew this. Mary knew this. Joseph knew this. And Jesus proves this. Because he is, who is he? Emmanuel. God with us. God with his people. The fulfillment of all the promises to Israel. And let me ask this question. Who then are the people of God? Who then are the people of God? Who are the people this promise is fulfilled for? Who are the people that this promise is fulfilled for? The answer is simple. All who believe. Jew and Gentile, all who believe, God will fulfill this promise for you that you will dwell with him. God wants to dwell with you. You know, your brother might not want to share a room with you or your sister, <laughs> but God wants to dwell with you. He wants to live with you. God wants to give you the chance to fulfill your original purpose in life. That's what he wants to do. You do have a purpose. You don't need to read some self-help book to find it. <laughs> God tells you what it is to enjoy him forever. See, this is why Jesus had to deal with our sins on the cross. This is why he did this. Remember, what does sin do? Sin casts us from the presence of God, and only holiness can restore that presence. And what's our biggest problem? None of us are holy. None of us are perfectly holy. God had to restore this himself because none of us are holy, which is why Jesus died for your sins and my sins and our sins and all the sins of all who would believe. And anyone who trusts in him, anyone who repents from their sins and trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ will benefit from this promise of Emmanuel, which means God with us, and will dwell with him for an eternity. So how do we apply this sermon this morning? How do we apply this sermon this morning? I really only have one point of application, and it's really simple. If you are seeking to fulfill your purpose in anything other than God, you will fail. If you are seeking to fulfill your purpose in anything other than God, you will fail. If you don't believe me, ask Jim Carrey. I can tell you what, he's achieved more than most of us, probably any of us, right, in this life. Uh, wealth, fame, you know, adoration, all sorts of stuff. And what did he, he said, it's not enough. It doesn't fulfill. You were created by God and for God, and so only in God can you find that satisfaction. As the book of Ecclesiastes says, there is eternity in the hearts of man, and no amount of money can fill eternity. No amount of pleasures of this world can fill eternity. Only the Lord Jesus Christ can. See, virtually all of the evils that we face in our own lives and in this world come down to this one simple fact. We try to find satisfaction outside of God <laughs> and outside of his purposes for our life. And if we do this, we will fail. Every day, people doing this kills marriages, causes depression, creates broken hearts and relationships, creates jealousy, strife, and anger, and more. And every day, people cause themselves or others pain by seeking for satisfaction outside of the one place where we can only find it, which is in God. Remember what Asaph said in that beautiful psalm? Psalm 73, 25 to 26, Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail. See, you could try and find satisfaction in yourself. They say to look inside yourself. What's going to happen? You're going to fail yourself. <laughs> my Flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. 
What is your purpose in life? Your purpose in life is to have eternal, perfect pleasure and satisfaction in God. So if you want pleasure and satisfaction, that's good. You're supposed to want that. You just got to find it in the right place. And if you look for it in the wrong place, there's another passage in Jeremiah 2. It says, um, my people have committed two sins. They have rejected the living cisterns of God and replaced it with broken cisterns. Uh, what is a cistern? A cistern is a well. And what's a broken cistern full of dirt? In other words, what he's saying is his people are filling their mouth with dirt when God's offering them the life of, of living waters. There's only satisfaction in God. This is why you need to believe in God because there is, <laughs> there is no hope outside of this for anyone. For anyone. So in conclusion, Matthew shows us how the Lord Jesus Christ is the hope of the Israelites that they were waiting for and the hope that you and I need and the only one in whom there is hope. So why would you look anywhere else? But if you are struggling with your walk with God or if you're listening now or later and you do not yet believe, let me encourage you this morning. Come back to the God who wants to walk with you. Because in him you will find forgiveness of sins and eventually in heaven perfect satisfaction. Let me encourage you, do not turn down the offer. Take the free gift that he offers. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word and your truth. And we thank you for Emmanuel, that you came with us. We thank you came to us. We were lost and you sought us because you're the good shepherd. And Lord, we just pray that we would only seek satisfaction in you. And when we get distracted, when we start to look in other places and sinful places and we attempted to reject you, we pray that we would repent and come back before you, Lord. And if there's anyone here this morning who's struggling uh, with their faith in you or who does not yet believe or someone who's watching this later, Lord, we just pray you would open up their hearts and minds to trust in you. You're a good God. And you know what's best for us. Help us to look for joy in you above all else in Jesus' name.